and thanks everyone for coming out to hear a little bit about some of the ideas I've been thinking about with uh, a lot of collaborators in recent years and, and some I'll also share some ideas for the future. So excited to maybe get into some of that during the Q&A as well. Um, yeah, so as, as Cole mentioned, I'm, I'm really fascinated by the relationships between uh, how animals make behavioral decisions, the information they use and produce in those behaviors, um, and how those behaviors relate to the biophysical dynamics of the ecosystems they inhabit. Um, and as you can see in the title of my uh, talk today, I'll be talking about these ideas mostly in uh, oceanic ecosystems, so in the open and deep ocean. Uh, and to sort of set the stage for this, I, uh, in thinking about the biophysical dynamics of those ecosystems, I like to start with these, well, there we go, we'll start with these krill, uh, because I think they're a really nice representative of what life and behavior is like uh, for an animal inhabiting the open or deep ocean. Um, so a really important concept uh, for the distribution of, of life and resources in, in these pelagic ecosystems is the concept of patchiness. Uh, and this is the uneven distribution of resources across the land or seascape. Um, and in oceanic ecosystems, we see this patchiness across nested uh, spatial scales. So you can see in the figure here, this is an example of forage, forage fish density. You can see these really clear schools of fish, fish that are patchily distributed across the landscape. But we also see this patchiness uh, across spatial scales from within uh, the patch to between patches to really uh, ocean basin scales. Another really important to consider here is not just the spatial patchiness of these resources, but also the temporal dynamism of the uh, fluid uh, ocean ecosystems. Uh, these patches are not only really unevenly distributed throughout the seascape, but they're also fluidly moving in space and time. Um, another really important element to consider is that most of the global ocean looks something like this. Uh, almost the entirety of this ecosystem is completely devoid of any light. Um, and that creates really interesting dynamics for animals uh, su searching for resources and also sharing information with one another about the location of those resources, intentionally or unintentionally. Um, it's also really interesting, I think, to think about the spatial scale of information transfer in these ecosystems. Um, many animals, uh, uh, predators in particular, in the open and deep ocean ecosystems use sound to see the world around them uh, in the darkness. Um, and because of the aqueous medium, especially low frequency sounds travel very far and very fast in this environment, which enables uh, information transfer even between individuals that are not proximate to one another. So if we zoom out a little bit and think about this in relation to uh, perhaps better understood terrestrial ecosystems in many cases, uh, there's really key differences here in terms of the ecosystem scale and structure, uh, the nature of spatiotemporal resource patchiness, and then also the sensory modalities and communication ranges of the animals inhabiting these ecosystems. Um, and I draw out this contrast because I think uh, from the standpoint of understanding how animals use and produce information to drive their behaviors, these are all really important factors to consider. Um, in particular, there's a really growing and robust body of literature on how spatial temporal ecosystem dynamics interact with animals' perception, sensing, and communication. Um, so as a quick example of this, uh, we can think about maybe two different hypothetical examples where we have a resource uh, on the left here uh, that's not very patchy in space uh, relative to the uh, scenario on the right. And if we think about animals that have their own perception of this ecosystem, their own personal information they're acquiring about the distribution of this resource, it may be very limited to their proximate surroundings. Um, but through social information transfer, animals actually gain information to non-local information, which in a uh, resource distribution that looks like something like this can be very valuable. Uh, for example, this fish in the top left here that's really kind of in, stuck in its own sensory world in a very low resource part of the landscape uh, may be able to benefit from either intentional or unintentional social information transfer to move towards this region of higher resource density. Um, so this non-local social information can be really valuable in these patchy landscapes uh, because it can enable collective sensing. Uh, so this can include, as I mentioned, sort of inadvertent social cues, the um, animals eavesdropping on uh, social information that others are producing, uh, but also intentional social signals, which can lead to the evolution of uh, cooperation and in, uh, intentional communication. So if we zoom back out here and think about these spatial temporal ecosystem dynamics and how they relate to animals' perception and sensing and communication, there's also this clear uh, connection to collective behavioral processes. 
Um, and so there's then, as I mentioned, a really robust literature on, on the connections between these three different topics in recent years. Um, I'm throwing a bunch up here. Uh, and one thing I will say that most of these papers have in common is something that we found in a paper that I was lucky enough to work on with a great group of collaborators um, about understanding how animals use social information when making timing decisions in their migrations. Uh, this is work that I did uh, with uh, Kanoe, who is an outstanding undergraduate researcher who is now working on a master's thesis uh, with us uh, at Stanford University. Um, and one of the things we found in this paper uh, is that the distribution of taxa and ecosystems in which these topics has been studied is really uneven. Uh, so the vast majority of this work, perhaps unsurprising, has been done uh, focused on birds. Uh, there's been a lot of work on mammals as well within those mammals, uh, mostly terrestrial mammals. Um, and as I mentioned, there's these really different spatiotemporal ecosystem dynamics in the terrestrial versus marine realms. Uh, so I'm really, uh, I think this is a representative example of how we have a lot of work to do to really fill in a more holistic understanding of, of the connections between information, behavior, and resource dynamics and ecosystems to include uh, Earth's largest habitable space. Um, and doing that, of course, relies on sort of uh, lessening the gap in terms of our ability to make detailed observations of individual and group level behavior. Uh, in these open and deep ocean ecosystems. So a lot of the work I'll talk about today is really focused on that goal of, of improving our capacity to make those observations so we can start to answer some of these uh, more theoretical questions. Uh, so today I'm gonna tell uh, three stories uh, under these topics. Um, but before I get into that, I just also wanna emphasize that all of this is happening not only in ecosystems that are very dynamic, but also ecosystems that, as we all know, are obviously changing rapidly in the Anthropocene. Uh, so I'm really interested in how our understanding of how animals respond to uh, variable conditions in ecosystems can inform our understanding of how they're going to respond to change in the ecosystems they habit, inhabit, whether that be spatial change, uh, temporal change in the phenology of resources, uh, or more direct anthropogenic impacts uh, due to the glowing in industrialization of, of ecosystems, including those in the open and deep sea. So the three stories I'll, I'll talk about a little bit today uh, on the topics of collective behavior and dynamic and changing oceanic ecosystems include first, um, a series of studies on uh, blue whale foraging and migration, seeking to understand their uh, adaptability and uh, to changing eco ecosystem conditions and also the information sources they use to make behavioral decisions in this dynamic ecosystem. I'll then uh, dive a, a little bit deeper into some work that I've been doing with collaborators on uh, sperm whales. Uh, trying to expand our toolkit to understand foraging and migration and social processes in uh, top predator of the deep sea. Um, and then finally, on with a very brief vignette about some of the ways that myself and collaborators are, are trying to take uh, a cue from the animals themselves to uh, take a more collective approach to sensing ecosystems uh, to enhance both the equity and e efficacy of our research programs. So first, uh, we'll, we'll turn to the blue whale stories here. Um, and just to set the stage, so we're all on the same page of, of you know, this population and the ecosystem they're inhabiting, uh, we're looking here at the California Current Large Marine Ecosystem. Uh, a real centerpiece of this story will be Monterey Bay, which is a foraging hotspot for blue whales in the eastern North Pacific uh, that migrate and feed seasonally in different parts of this ecosystem. Uh, the Monterey Bay is bisected by this massive submarine canyon that's comparable in size to the Grand Canyon. Um, and this is an amazing place for aggregate. Uh, this is something that we know from many years of, of study. And for this reason, it's, it's a real hot spot of blue whale foraging activity uh, during the summer and fall as blue whales pursue the only prey item that they will con consume, which is krill. Um, in this ecosystem, it's a, it's a very seasonal ecosystem. And the primary uh, process that's driving that seasonality is a uh, oceanographic process known as upwelling. Uh, so this is the process by which uh, alongshore surface winds are interacting with the rotation of the earth to drive warmer surface waters offshore where they're replaced by this uh, upwelled water, this deep, cold, nutrient-rich water, which when it's injected into the sunlit surface layer creates an explosion of life that propagates up the food web all the way to uh, blue whales, which uh, forage on dense krill swarms in, in this upwelling region during the summer and fall. Um, this seasonal upwelling uh, can really vary year to year in both the timing and intensity of upwelling. So uh, as an example here, you can see there's a really wide climatological envelope here on terms of 
the amount of nutrients that are being injected into the sunlit surface layer by this upwelling process. Uh, and you can see that uh, key timing events in the phenology of, of, of upwelling vary year to year as well, such as the onset and the peak and the, sensation, the cessation of seasonal upwelling. So given that blue whales are uh, foraging in this ecosystem in the summer and fall, uh, during and following the upwelling season, and then making a decision of when to depart this foraging in re arena to uh, head south for the winter where they feed very little, if at all, for several months as they give birth and rear their young before migrating uh, thousands of kilometers back to the uh, coasts of California. Um, they really face this important question of when to forage and when to migrate. It's really a central question uh, in terms of their own individual fitness and then in terms of population health uh, to be able to maximally exploit the very limited season of uh, foraging opportunity that they have at higher latitudes. So a question I was really interested in asking and trying to answer is to understand how blue whales make this really critical decision in their lives. And to answer that question, uh, one of the key tools that I've leaned on uh, is a long-term passive acoustic monitoring program in the Monterey Bay region. Uh, so this is a program that uh, has been led by Dr. John Ryan at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute and I've, that I've been a close collaborator on now for a number of years. Um, and this is a program enabled by incredible marine infrastructure at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. Uh, so this circle on the map here just outside of the Monterey Bay Submarine Canyon is an uh, undersea cabled observatory. You can think of this almost as like a, a sea floor laboratory at uh, 891 meters depth. It's connected back to our lab in Moss Landing, California by a cable that's a little bit over 50 kilometers long. And it gives us a constant uh, data feed of, of the soundscape in one direction. And we give it a constant power supply in the other direction. So we can record around the clock uh, for many years at a very, very high sample rate of 256 kilohertz. Uh, so this instrument has been recording nearly continuously since the summer of 2015. Uh, this, these numbers are actually a little bit dated. I think we have now exceeded 200 terabytes of acoustic data collected from this instrument, which we share with the public with some uh, analysis tools that make that large uh, data volume a little bit easier to handle. Um, during this recording period, we've had more than a thousand days where we detected the songs of blue whales over what we estimate to be uh, roughly a 10,000 square kilometer sampling region from uh, this single uh, instrument that's roughly the size of your thumb. Um, I've mentioned Blue Whale Song now, and that's gonna be a really central part of this, this story. So I just wanna make sure everyone's oriented to what I'm talking about when I mention Blue Whale Song. Uh, so I'll take a pause here and let the Blue Whales tell you themselves. So these three units, the A call, the B call, and the C call, will be repeated for many hours at a time as we uh, produce these uh, really low frequency songs. Um, and you'll notice that the B call, which actually is by far the most common unit that they produce in their songs, is also the highest amplitude signal uh, in these songs. And because of this, and because of its very stereotyped nature, we're able to uh, use a pretty simple energy detection metric to quantify the amount of blue whale song in the Monterey Bay soundscape at any time. And um, we do this pretty simply by uh, quantifying the amplitude of signals in this very narrow narrow frequency band uh, that is in line with the third harmonic of the B call that you see here, and comparing that to nearby background frequencies, uh, the amount of acoustic energy at these nearby background frequencies. So by taking this pretty simple ratio of target to background frequencies, we're able to essentially create this call index, as we call it, um, that represents the intensity of Blue Whale Song in the soundscape at any uh, moment in time over many years of recording. So I mentioned before that we have roughly a 10,000 square kilometer detection range for these songs. Uh, that's what this looks like on a map. All of the colored areas you see here around our recording site uh, are colors that indicate a higher acoustic energy level than the background ambient noise level of this part of the ocean meaning we can resolve blue whale songs in the soundscape over this entire colored region. Um, and over many years of recording, uh, we've been able to characterize the average annual cycle of blue whale song patterns uh, in this region. So first I'll show here um, many years of data condensed into an average annual climatology of that call index metric, the uh, blue whale song intensity in the soundscape. 
And you can see it rises throughout the summer into the fall months before tapering off into the winter as these uh, animals migrate south for the year. Um, we can also look at the average daily patterns of these songs. Uh, so here I'm showing the night to day ratio of that call index. So any values above one are indicating that the blue whales are singing more at night and any values below one indicate more song during the daytime. Um, and I remember the first time my collaborators and I produced this figure, I was really struck by two patterns that, that jump out to me here, uh, two overlapping, overlapping segments to the seasonal cycle. The first being the summer and fall months where song intensity is rising and the majority of song is being produced during the nighttime. And then this uh, period where song intensity, is, song intensity is tapering off and we have a more even distribution of song throughout the daytime and the nighttime. Um, and to have such clear signals jump out over you know, many years of recording over such an enormous ocean area, many individuals' behaviors represented in this figure, uh, it really struck me that there must be some other behavioral explanation of what is driving these really clear patterns in both seasonal song intensity, but also the diel patterns of the songs being produced. So to try to understand the behavioral context of this population level pattern, um, I turned to individual level methods to understand the behavioral context of blue whale song production. Um, and I did this uh, in collaboration with Jeremy Goldbogen's lab group at Stanford University, uh, where we used these uh, suction cup attached tags that carry a whole suite of instruments, uh, including video cameras, audio recorders, accelerometers, uh, GPS, uh, so on and so forth, as you can see here. Uh, and we attached these instruments to the backs of whales in Monterey Bay and the surrounding region. Um, and it gives us a really incredible view into the lives of these animals uh, below the surface uh, where they're spending most of their time feeding and singing. So this is an example of the sort of video that we get from these tags. Uh, you'll see one blue whale feeding here in a moment as recorded from the back of another blue whale. You can see here the blue whales are simultaneously lunging on this dense swarm of krill, uh, which they'll spend about the next 30 to 60 seconds uh, filtering through their baleen plates. Um, and they'll do this several times on a single dive and, and many thousand times uh, over the course of a day in a foraging season. Um, I think this video is very beautiful, but uh, the data that comes off of the other sensors on these tags is also really valuable for us in terms of understanding what the lives of foraging blue whales look like. So this is a representative tag deployment from a blue whale in Monterey Bay. Uh, you can see over a 24 hour period, the dive profile of this animal is a black line. At the bottom of each of these dives during the daytime, we're seeing intensive uh, feeding, those lunges you just saw in the video. Um, and then during the nighttime, you see a, a much less feeding activity, except for this very intensive crepuscular feeding period. Um, and we see more of the activity being more surface oriented song production behavior. Um, and this is a, you know, one individual, but over many, individuals in many years, we see similar patterns where most of the song production is happening during the nighttime and most of the foraging is happening at depth during the daytime. Um, if we zoom out in time a little bit, uh, we occasionally are able to uh, get these tags to stay on these animals for much longer periods of time to capture migration in addition to the foraging behavior. So that's what I'll show here. I'll break this down uh, one element at a time. Uh, the line that you're seeing here is indicating the latitude of this tagged individual over a roughly month long period. Uh, you can see the track over which this animal swam in the inset map towards the breeding grounds off of Central America. Um, and this dash line here is indicating uh, the foraging period versus the post foraging southward migration. And for each day of this tag deployment, we can overlay uh, every detected feeding lunge and every det detected song call event. So uh, as an example here, you can see the triangles indicating that this animal was singing throughout the month, but it was carrying this tag, uh, but it was only feeding again during that uh, pre-migration period. Uh, we can also uh, look at the dial patterns of feeding and singing here uh, by coloring these, these icons here. So here, uh, the blues are indicating more of a nighttime tendency and the reds are indicating more of a daytime tendency. So you'll see before the animal starts migrating south, uh, it's producing song, again, this familiar pattern, more song during the nighttime as indicated by the blue. But as it starts to migrate south, we see a mix of blues and whites and reds indicating a more even distribution of song over the daytime and the nighttime. Um, and so again, uh, performing similar analyses for multiple individuals, uh, we're able then to zoom back out to our population level patterns and realize that what we're hearing here is this 
population transitioning from foraging to breeding migration. Uh, so here, this period where we're hearing most of the song during the nighttime, the population is foraging. Uh, and as the song starts to be spread more evenly over the day and night, we're hearing the uh, southward breeding migration. Uh, so I like to think of this as a population level acoustic signature of migration. Um, that's a, I'm, it's a, uh, I think in and of itself an exciting finding hopefully, but it's also a really valuable tool to ask follow-up questions about when and why and how these animals are migrating at the population level. Um, to me, a really natural follow-up question now that we can identify the timing of migration acoustically is to explore interannual variability in the timing of migration. Uh, so asking the question of whether there's any interannual flexi flexibility in blue whales population timing of migration. So now rather than condensing all of that data down into a single average annual cycle, we can expand it out to a interannual time series. Here we're showing that night to day ratio of song intensity again um, with the red dots indicating periods during which we're getting a statistically significant decrease in that ratio, which as you will recall is indicative that the population is transitioning to the migratory behavioral state. So we see a lot of variability year to year. For example, a year like 2015, we had migration pretty early in the fall. A year like 2020, uh, migration happening in, in December and January. And even an interesting year like 2017, where we think we're hearing multiple waves of migration within the population. So the answer to this question simply is yes, there's incredible variation. Uh, we're seeing variation as over as much as four months out of the 12 month annual cycle. Um, so are variations in the timing of migration linked to the phenology of their foraging habitat? I won't get deep into these uh, methods in the interest of time, but we were able to conduct a series of phenological analyses of upwelling timing and intensity and found that uh, blue whales were in fact migrating later in years that had an earlier onset, a later peak, and a greater total accumulation of upwelling intensity. So if we zoom back out to the annual cycle of these animals as they're moving between this for higher latitude foraging habitat and lower la latitude breeding habitat, uh, what we showed in the series of studies is that blue whales exhibit interannual flexibility in terms of when they depart uh, the foraging habitat, uh, tracking contemporaneous ecosystem conditions. Um, and this is interestingly the ex exact opposite of what uh, Brianna Abrams and others have shown uh, in migration in the opposite direction as these animals are approaching the foraging habitat and arriving on the foraging habitat. And to me, this actually is, uh, it makes a lot of sense that there would be uh, different degrees of flexibility because when these animals are approaching the foraging habitat, they don't really have any contemporaneous ecosystem information to go off of, right? They're uh, perhaps hedging their bets and relying on long-term memory of average conditions uh, to time their arrival. But as they make the decision of when to depart, they've been feeding in this ecosystem for months now. They've accumulated information either individually and or socially uh, to make a more flexible decision that's in line with contemporaneous ecosystem conditions. One thing that really stuck with me when we were working on this is we kept talking about the use of individual and or social cues uh, to assess contemporaneous ecosystem conditions. Uh, and that was something that I really wanted to follow up on here to understand what information are these animals actually queuing off of to make this very impressive decision that's very in line with ecosystem phenology over an enormous potential foraging arena. Um, and this was a topic that I uh, worked on in a follow-up paper, both with Brianna and our collaborator, Stephanie Dodson, uh, using a series of uh, simulations in uh, connection with these empirical observations to understand how uh, blue whales eavesdrop on one another to make more accurate and, and better, better informed decisions of when to depart the foraging habitat. So I won't get deep into the model uh, construction here in the interest of time. Happy to talk about it during the Q&A if folks are interested, but I will show a couple of results here uh, where first I'm gonna show two different versions of this model where blue whales in the simulation space are either only given access to personal information of forage conditions, or they're allowed to both personally assess forage conditions, but also eavesdrop on one another's behavioral state as indicated by the dial patterns of the song, if you'll recall. Um, what we found is that in uh, simulations over a broad swath of parameters, uh, the individuals with access to social information migrate much later in the year. And we found that this was a much better match uh, for our empirical population level observations from the hydrophone that I, I showed before. 
Uh, we can also compare these model results to individual level data. So th this uh, shaded area here is indicating the range uh, from individual tag tracks of, of when animals uh, make a migratory departure from the foraging habitat. And again, we see a better match between our models that include the ability to eavesdrop on one another's uh, behavioral state. Uh, we also found in, in the model that uh, across both years with low, more average, and very high forage availability, uh, the social information consistently enables blue whales to uh, better exploit the, the possible uh, forage available to them in the foraging ecosystem in any given year. Uh, so you can see that here with the personal and social model allowing these animals to have a much higher relative krill intake uh, at the population level. Okay, so that was a whole lot about blue whales. I'm gonna take a deep breath here and do a very quick summary, just to say that we use passive acoustic monitoring and biologging tags to understand that blue whales have an acoustic signature of their transition from foraging to breeding migration. Uh, we're able to use that acoustic signature in relation to assessment of ecosystem phenology to understand uh, that this population is very flexible in the timing of their breeding migration. And then using a series of simulations in comparison to our empirical observations, we're able to assess that these animals are very likely eavesdropping on one another's behavioral state to make a better informed and more collective uh, uh, decisions about when to migrate. Okay, so that's a lot about blue whales. I'm gonna transition here uh, to the second uh, uh, story from the talk, uh, getting into some work that I've been uh, doing on sperm whales and other predators of the open and deep ocean, uh, thinking about how uh, the really uh, even, even different than the sunlit surface layer of the ocean, how the, the dark deep sea uh, creates uh, conditions that might lead to different uh, collective migration strategies and social information use. Uh, so again, just to orient us here, uh, we are really living on an ocean planet. This is the majority of the, the habitat available to life on this planet is in the deep ocean. So if we look uh, from a volumetric standpoint, uh, really the vast, vast majority of available habitat on this planet is deep ocean water that is completely devoid of sunlight. Um, and I'm really fascinated by this because uh, not only... Uh, sorry, getting ahead of myself here, uh, is this a really vast space, but it's also a space uh, in which we have very different expectations of how animals sense the world around them. So I mentioned before the really uh, huge importance of sound for many uh, pelagic predators. This is especially true uh, for animals that are diving into the deep ocean where uh, there really is no uh, visible inf uh, visual information. And one way that we can try to explore movements of animals in the space is to rely on networks of uh, passive acoustic monitoring. And this is something that I've been uh, really lucky to work on with some undergraduate students. Uh, Emma Pearson, who's now a PhD student at Oregon State University, did some really nice work uh, sh showing how we can assess population level movement uh, using networks of, of long-term hydrophone recordings throughout the open and deep ocean. Uh, Natalie Cross is an undergraduate honors thesis student at Stanford University who's extending some of this work to understand how marine heat waves impact the movement and uh, vocal behavior of some of these pelagic predators. But again, you'll notice here that this is focused on blue and fin whales, these predators that are more oriented towards the sunlit surface layer. Um, and what I was really interested in doing was taking this approach of a network of passive acoustic monitoring to assess the movements and behaviors of a uh, top predator of the deep sea. And the interest in the deep sea really comes from the differences that it displays relative to the sunlit surface layer. So uh, relative to terrestrial ecosystems and uh, near surface pelagic ecosystems, the, the deep sea is relatively little explored and poorly understood. Uh, it's often sort of thought of as this uh, resource scarce and static uh, space uh, because there's no direct connection to uh, uh, solar energy. Um, Again, there's little to no sunlight. And because of this, it's often assumed to be an aseasonal ecosystem because there's no direct connection to the uh, solar uh, seasonal cycles. As a result, uh, many of the highly mobile predators that live in this space are often referred to as nomads, uh, animals that are uh, sort of uh, wandering uh, the aseasonal depths in search of sporadically uh, distributed uh, forage opportunities. Um, this is a really th hard 
uh, thing to test directly. And it's sort of something we've assumed from our understanding of ecosystem dynamics in this space. Uh, but luckily, sperm whales give us a really amazing window into this world uh, through the sounds that they produce, allowing us to sort of test this hypothesis of nomadism in the deep sea. What we're hearing here is the echolocation clips of a sperm whale recorded in the uh, Monterey Bay region. Um, the first time I heard this, I thought it sounded very much like a machine, and it really is a, a biological machine. This is an incredible uh, adaptation for life in the deep here. Uh, these are very uh, clicks were recorded from a very distant individual, uh, but they're actually the loudest known biological sound on the planet. Uh, we don't know of any animal that makes a, a sound louder than this uh, echolocation that sperm whales use to see the world uh, around them uh, in the depths. Um, it also gives us an amazing opportunity to understand their behavior because they rely on producing this abundant acoustic information to see the world around them. And if we can successfully eavesdrop on that, we can learn a lot about their lives and behaviors. Um, so I was really interested in using that tool to understand sperm whale movements in the Northeast Pacific uh, as they forage in the deep sea throughout this region. Um, and we know from previous genetic uh, sightings and uh, historical whaling records analyses uh, that Blue whale, or sorry, sperm whales exhibit really wide ranging latitudinal movements in this ocean basin, but we really don't know much about the regularity, the seasonality, or the behavioral context of those long range movements. Um, luckily, I was able to uh, make use of two long term passive acoustic monitoring programs, one in the Gulf of Alaska, more than six years of acoustic recordings, um, and then also our, our system in the Monterey Bay region, which I talked about earlier in the talk with, with regard to blue whales. So using these two long-term passive acoustic monitoring data sets, I was really interested to first understand if there are seasonal or interannual patterns in uh, the detection of foraging sperm whales across these latitudes, with the hypothesis that if these animals are nomads, there should be really irregular patterns of detection across latitudes. Um, and then to think about what movement strategy drives these patterns of acoustic detection, again, uh, the sort of prevailing thought has been that these animals are nomads tracking aseasonal irregular prey resources. To, so to assess this first question, we first needed to be able to automatically detect these clicks, which last for a fraction of a second in many, many years of audio data. Uh, to do this, uh, I developed an algorithm that uh, really targets this uh, low frequency component of sperm whale clicks. Uh, and this is a nice area to target because sperm whale clicks are kind of like a acoustic flashlight. They're very, very directional. They uh, target the energy at a specific uh, point. Uh, but the very low frequency parts of that click actually spread in all directions, making it the most reliable part of the signal uh, for assessing the presence of animals in an area. Um, and they're also very regular in their spacing as they're using these clicks to search in the dark depths. So the algorithm I developed uh, took advantage of this by looking for peaks in this frequency range at regular intervals of the known interclick interval of sperm whale echolocation. Um, and by applying this algorithm to more than seven years of acoustic data, we were able to assess daily presence or absence of this uh, signal uh, with 96% uh, balanced accuracy over that full period. So applying that to more than seven years of data and then again, condensing it down to an average annual cycle, this is what we found. Uh, we found that one, sperm whales are in the Monterey Bay region, the California current system, quite a bit, uh, just less than 50% of the days over our seven plus year study period. Uh, this alone was pretty shocking. Uh, I've never seen a sperm whale in many, many days doing field work on the water in Monterey Bay. Uh, I've spoken with folks who operate whale watch boats in the region and have spent you know decades of almost every day on the water and have seen maybe one or two in their lives. Uh, so to know that these animals are actually here year round uh, and with great frequency was, was really a shocking result to me um, and really speaks to the power of using acoustic tools in studying deep sea animals that are very cryptic to human observers. Um, the other thing you'll notice here, uh, sort of a subtle seasonal signal here where there's a, a minimum in the summer and a maximum in the winter months. Um, and using a generalized additive model, uh, we found that month alone explains roughly half the deviance in monthly percent presence. Uh, which indicates to me that there is clearly a sig seasonal signal uh, in this data set. 
Uh, thinking interannually here, you can see you know, now this average annual cycle uh, decomposed in each uh, year of our study. Uh, there is a pretty consistent seasonal cycle here, but we do see flexibility in that seasonal cycle as well. Uh, for example, in 2016, we had a much higher uh, rate of presence in the Monterey Bay region uh, during the final year of a massive marine heat wave in El Nino that had really widespread impacts uh, throughout the Gulf of Alaska and the California current system. Um, zooming back out to the broader uh, you know, study region of the Northeast Pacific, everything I've sh shown so far uh, was from Monterey Bay. So here's that average annual cycle for Monterey Bay. But I mentioned this previous work that assessed similar uh, metrics in the Gulf of Alaska. And uh, to me, this is, was a really interesting pattern to see that we have a lot of similarities across latitudes here. Uh, we have animals present roughly half of the days out of each study period. Uh, they're present year round. And there's a subtle seasonal cycle in both uh, latitudes. Um, you'll also notice that those seasonal cycles are exactly opposite one another, with the peak at higher latitudes in the summer and the peak at lower latitudes in the winter, as you can see here. So the, to our first question, we found that there's year-round presence across latitudes, but there is also this su subtle seasonality across latitudes, uh, which really begs the question of what movement strategy in, the animals, in those, these animals would drive uh, those population-level patterns of detection. Um, and to sort of a, to assess this, uh, we did some hypothesis, te hypothesis testing, again, via simulations of individual movement. Um, and this was work that was enabled uh, uh, by uh, previous work by, by Brianna Abrams and colleagues, uh, where they assessed a large volume of uh, animal tracking data across life histories, across marine, terrestrial, fresh water ecosystems, to come up with these uh, common movement syndromes of vertebrate movement. Um, and using the distributions of step lengths and turn angles that uh, Brianna and colleagues uh, uh, defined in this study, we were able to, we had the raw materials to create simulations of different hypothesized movement strategies for sperm whales in the Northeast Pacific. Uh, so for the figures I'm about to show here, uh, all of them are in a simulated domain and you'll see in our simulated domain, a northern acoustic monitoring area akin to the Gulf of Alaska hydrophone, a southern acoustic monitoring area akin to the Monterey Bay hydrophone. And you'll also, also see one example individual from the simulation of many, many individuals uh, where you'll see their track as well as their location on some key uh, points uh, throughout the year, the first, middle, and final day of the year. And then you'll also see the population-wide latitudinal distribution of, of agents throughout the summer and the winter. Okay, so these hypothesized movement strategies are, are hypotheses that have been pulled uh, from literature on sperm whales throughout the years, uh, folks speculating about what these animals might be doing in the Northeast Pacific. First, that nomadic resource tracking that I mentioned before. Uh, you can see this individual is uh, nomadically moving throughout the ecosystem, tracking a aseasonal uh, prey resource. And you see that leads to a relatively uniform distribution of the population across latitudes and across seasons. Uh, we can also uh, take a slight variation off the nomadic resource tracking uh, and simulate uh, individuals that are seasonal resource trackers. So moving with very similar movement rules to the nomads, but now the resource that they're tracking exhibits seasonal latitudinal variation. And you can see that that leads to uh, these subtle patterns of seasonality at the population level across latitudes. Uh, we can think of a more strict seasonal migration like that that we see in blue whales, for example, or many uh, terrestrial birds uh, that may be familiar to folks. Um, and you can see here, this leads to really, really strong seasonal latitudinal patterns and population level distribution. Um, and finally, we uh, hypothesize a partial se seasonal migration where uh, one demographic group, adult males, is conducting the seasonal migration between distinct habitats and the rest of the population is nomadic uh, within only a part of the, the range, the southern part of the range here. So by simulating many agents for many years under these different movement strategies and comparing to our empirical patterns of acoustic detection across latitudes, we're able to assess these hypotheses of, of what sperm whales might be doing uh, from a movement tactic standpoint in the Northeast Pacific. Uh, so again, here you can see our empirical observations across latitudes. Um, and now I'll show the results from those series of simulations uh, and you can see here first our seasonal resource tracking migration, uh, giving presence across latitudes, uh, 
throughout the year, but also the subtle seasonality that we see in our empirical observations. I'll run through these very quickly, but uh, the nomadic resource tracking migration just leads to uh, relatively static uh, detection rates across latitudes. Uh, the seasonal migration between distinct habitats, as you might expect, you have a part of the year where you hear animals in one location and a part of the year where you hear animals in the other location. Um, and then kind of a mix of the nomadism and seasonal migration for a partially migratory population. Um, so by statistically comparing our simulations to our empirical observations, we actually found that the hypothesis that best fits our empirical observations is that these animals are what we might refer to as a resource tracking migrant, not strictly migrating between distinct feeding and breeding habitats, but moving uh, across latitudes to track a seasonal latitudinal variation in some resource. Um, I'm, I'm excited about this result. I'll, I'll just close the, the sperm whale section here by saying that I'm excited about this result because uh, it really points towards uh, subtle seasonality in deep sea ecosystems more broadly. Uh, sperm whales really are the apex predator of this ecosystem. And the fact that we're seeing uh, such a clear signature of uh, seasonality in the movement and foraging behavior at the highest trophic level indicates to me that there really is seasonality in these ecosystems, uh, which makes sense in a way, because even though there's not a direct connection to sol solar cycles, uh, the nutrient input into deep sea ecosystems is actually indirectly coming from the sun as nutrients and, and detritus that are falling from the sunlit surface layer propagate down into the deep sea. Um, and I think it's really exciting to see that uh, that seasonality is strong enough that it propagates all the way up to the apex predator of this ecosystem. Um, everything I've talked about so far has been in the context of the migration of these animals. Just going to check the time really quickly here. Um, 15 minutes, thank you. Um, something I've been really interested in uh, as I've, I've uh, been working on my postdoctoral research at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute is to think about some of uh, these patterns of behavior and the information that drives the behavior of these animals, not just at migratory time scales, but also at really uh, fine scale uh, fine temporal scales of foraging aggregations. Um, and to try to understand this, it requires uh, a little bit more detail and observation, not just of the predators and the ecosystem, but also of the distribution and behavior of the prey that these animals are pursuing. Uh, so uh, through a, a, a grant from the David and Lucille Packard Foundation, in my postdoc, I've developed this pelagic predator prey behavioral observatory that is allowing us to start to ask and answer some of these sorts of questions at the finer temporal scales of foraging aggregations. Um, so just to give a quick overview of what myself and the team I've been working with have been implement, implementing over the past several years uh, in the Monterey Bay region, uh, we've relied on a real a, a network of sensors targeted towards understanding predator, prey, and ecosystem dynamics uh, concurrently in space and time. Uh, one key element of, of this observatory, as I mentioned before, the animal-borne biologgers, which uh, carry a suite of sensors to measure really individual level uh, behavior. Uh, we also use uh, a, a robot uh, that's a, a, what we refer to as a wave glider. It's an auto autonomous surface vehicle uh, that carries what we refer to as multi-frequency echo sounders on the bottom of it. So this is an instrument that's actually putting acoustic energy into the environment and listening for backscatter across multiple frequencies. Um, and different body materials or body structures refract this acoustic energy at different frequencies differently. So by listening to the backscatter off of these animals' bodies, we actually can determine not only where is prey aggregating in the environment, but what is the composition of that, that prey aggregation. So this is, allows us to resolve, for example, uh, when and where krill swarms are forming in the environment, when and where fish are schooling in the environment, so on and so forth. Uh, we also use a series of subsurface moorings that carry hydrophones to listen to more group and population level behaviors, as I've talked about throughout this talk, but also critically carrying instruments to measure the physical movement of this ecosystem and how that can force uh, the behavior of these animals, but also the distribution of more planktonic organisms uh, in this, this system. And finally, we rely on that uh, cabled seafloor observatory that I mentioned before that's adjacent to our observatory, which we've recently outfitted uh, in collaboration with the Naval Postgraduate School with a directional hydrophone. Uh, this is an instrument that's not only listening to the sounds that animals are producing, but it's also pointing to where those sounds are arriving from. 
giving us more spatially explicit information about where social information is being produced in the environment and how that relates to the distribution of predators and prey and physical forcing that we're measuring using these other observatory elements. Um, I'm not gonna get into any results from this today because this is work that's very much ongoing. Uh, and it's actually work that in part that I'm here at University of Washington uh, to work on uh, with Andrew Berdahl and with Brianna Abrams and others. Um, so hopefully at a future date, I'll have more to say about what we're actually learning from this system. It's been a big logistical lift uh, just to collect and process these many concurrent data streams. Okay, so now that I've talked a lot about blue whales and sperm whales and krill and so on and so forth, I want to close the talk with a really brief uh, vignette about some work that my collaborators and I have been doing to uh, really take a more collective approach to understanding uh, animal behavior and ecosystem dynamics. Uh, I think I mentioned at the outset of the talk that I'm inspired by, uh, for example, the, the blue whale paper that I mentioned where blue whales are listening to one information from one another, creating this really widespread social network, if you will, this collective sensory network that's allowing them to assess ecosystem variation at the extreme scale of the Northeast Pacific Ocean. Um, and we as humans have an incredible capacity for this kind of social information exchange. And I think similarly should be relying on that to make better sense of what's happening uh, in the changing ecosystems around us. So one uh, real entry point for me into the sort of work of thinking about uh, applying some of the insights that we derive from these uh, behavioral ecology studies and working with human communities in that uh, comes from the dynamic nature of the ocean itself. Uh, sort of my introduction to the, the management space was through this concept of dynamic management, uh, where uh, folks are interested in, in having more flexible and spatially temporally dynamic management practices uh, to reflect the spatial and temporally dynamic nature of animal movement, of ecosystem processes, which is especially valuable in the ocean, which is this fluid medium that's constantly moving in space and time. So just as a simple example of this, uh, a, a lot of folks have, have thought about the value of dynamic pr protected areas that can move uh, in space and time and the benefits that that can, can enable uh, for both humans and wildlife relative to a static protected area. Um, and you'll notice, again, I mentioned the extreme value of, of, of these approaches in the marine realm. Uh, this is from a, a review I led a few years ago about uh, assessing these dynamic management programs, both in marine and terrestrial systems, and understanding the spatial and temporal scales over which uh, these management programs update their recommendations. Um, and one thing that we found here is that uh, these really fine temporal scale programs are much more common in the marine realm, again, reflecting the really fluid and dynamic nature of those ecosystems. Um, and one of the takeaways I had from that is that this is ultimately uh, a management and governance problem to have something that's updating on such rapid timescales is a really challenging thing for human communities to, to deal with, both implementing, but also responding to as resource users. Um, and so as a result, we rely heavily on algorithmic solutions and on uh, automated input of, of animal movement, biodiversity data, ecosystem process data to enable these kinds of programs. Um, and you all may have seen this paper that came out earlier this year, about the extraordinary biases that exist in the input data to these sorts of algorithms that we use increasingly to make management decisions. Uh, so this uh, paper looked at uh, publicly avail available global biodiversity data, primarily in the terrestrial realm, and showed that actually many of the patterns that we see in those data sets are more reflective of human uh, socioeconomic processes than they are of anything we know about ecology. Um, and so that reflects an extreme bias of our own observing behaviors that propagates potentially into the management realm and can have impacts on both human and wildlife lives. Um, and I've, I've been thinking about this a lot uh, in terms of how we can enhance the equity of data collection, algorithmic assessment and management application. Uh, again, I'm really interested uh, in the marine realm uh, these days. So I've thought about it a lot in that context, uh, thinking about how we can, throughout the process of, of these sorts of algorithmic assessments, uh, think about equity in, in terms of uh, the assembly of teams and the development of projects through to data collection and aggregation and algorithm design through the assessment of multiple potential algorithmic, algorithmic solutions. Um, 
And there's a lot more uh, in this paper that we wrote uh, specifically about this problem as it relates to the uh, United Nations uh, uh, new treaty on the protection of the high seas, areas beyond national jurisdiction. Uh, but it's also a problem that really applies in every ecosystem on earth, right? Um, increasingly, we're seeing industrialization, not only of terrestrial and, and uh, really coastal ecosystems, but also these more pelagic ecosystems uh, as we you know, expand our search for solutions to the climate crisis, for example. Um, and this is something that really hits home uh, in the areas that I've been working for many years now off of Central California, uh, as uh, the Morrow Bay wind energy area has been uh, slated and lease sales uh, to wind energy companies have already begun to develop uh, a, really a large industrial project uh, in this part of the world, which uh, is complex in many ways. And this certainly is not uh, any sort of uh, indictment of the need for renewable energy sources, but an acknowledgement that this is a massive industrial shift in the space that has historically not seen so much industrial activity. Uh, interestingly, it's also adjacent to both existing and uh, this has proposed, but recently designated, I should say, national marine sanctuaries, including the first uh, indigenous nominated national marine sanctuary in the history of this country. Uh, so really an interesting space in which to be thinking about uh, how we assess who's here, how to manage these spaces and their growing industrialization. Uh, I've been really lucky to work with a wide swath of collaborators on this region to hopefully take a more collective approach to thinking about the application of our ability to observe animal behavior to these management questions. Uh, and again, that's been through a series of long-term acoustic monitoring stations. So I mentioned those that we've implemented uh, with Ambari in the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. We also have uh, worked with a, a broader collective that's under the umbrella of the NOAA Sank Sound program to implement uh, more acoustic monitoring stations throughout this region. And then most recently in co collaboration with the Northern Chumash Tribal Council uh, and other tribal partners uh, in relation to the newly designated Chumash Heritage National Marine Sanctuary. Um, and this network of acoustic recorders is now creating an opportunity similar to what I described for the sperm whales across the whole expanse of the Northeast Pacific. It's allowing us this more regional view into how animals are using this space uh, across multiple connected sanctuaries and industrial areas uh, in, in their movements throughout this really important foraging habitat. And this has been a really exciting uh, collective endeavor. Again, uh, it's enabled the opportunity, as I mentioned, really at each stage of the project, from the conceptualization of the project to the implementation of data collection, to the assessment of what sort of data analysis we should be doing and what sort of management questions we want to approach with these data. Uh, it's really been a collective across university and private research institutions, uh, federal and tribal government partners uh, at each stage of the process. And I've been you know, just one participant in this and it's been a real learning experience for me uh, to think about how, how to approach this work in a space, especially in the Pelagic Ocean, that historically has been uh, accessible to a very, very small number of people. Just an example of some of the sorts of science that we're doing using this data set we've been collecting collectively. Uh, Ella Kim is a PhD candidate at Scripps that's been working on this project with us. Uh, and she's been detecting the sounds that uh, fish make whenever they're forming mating aggreg aggregations to assess across the, this uh, uh, connected sanctuary region. Uh, when and where different rock fish species are spawning. Uh, I can't help myself, but uh, start to analyze the whale acoustic data from uh, these different regions. Uh, this is our site that's closest to the offshore wind energy area, uh, where we've already been able to establish that uh, the three uh, major baleen whale species in this region are very, very active, uh, directly adjacent to this wind energy area, which is uh, not something that was previously known. Um, and it's just been a, a really interesting process uh, throughout this of just continuously uh, having this, this iteration amongst the group that we're working with about what really we're trying to do with these data from the applied standpoint. Of course, there's interesting theoretical behavioral ecology questions to be asked and answered here, but there's also real uh, uh, questions about human wildlife conflict uh, to, to be approached with these data sets. So feeling very lucky to learn from this opportunity. It's also inspired me to think even bigger than this. That's still a pretty small collection of people working in a very small part of 
the world, which I think is really important for the local management context and the local, local cultural context. But I've also been really lucky to work uh, as a scientific advisor for this uh, NASA project, which has been sending for free these very uh, low cost acoustic recorders uh, to participatory scientists throughout North America uh, to really collect a high density of, of passive acoustic recordings throughout the continent, uh, similar to similar efforts you uh, might have seen around camera trapping, for example. Um, and that's been really inspiring to me, again, to think about just the burgeoning public enthusiasm to be a part of scientific discovery in the 21st century, right? This is a, the world we live in now, and, and trying to think about ways to tap into that to really collectively move towards uh, a better understanding of the world around us. Okay, so those are the three stories I wanted to tell today. And I've said a lot of words here, so I'm gonna close with words from someone else uh, who's much better spoken than I am. Um, these are words pulled from one of my favorite uh, science books, The Great Animal Orchestra by the amazing uh, musician and acoustic ecologist, Bernie Krauss, uh, who I think sums it up really well here of the, the power of listening to animal behavior to understand uh, how animals are responding to change in the ecosystem they inhabit. And a few things that he mentions here are just that what we're recording are significant messages for any sentient being. And those messages contain information about survival, reproduction, and communication. And to me, the significant message, messages include for human listeners, uh, not only where animals are, but what they're doing, if we can decode the behavioral content of the sounds they're producing. Um, and then also for wildlife, really critical social information that can allow them to mediate their own sur survival and reproduction. So then coming back to the human listeners, uh, if we really dive deep into understanding acoustic ecology, uh, we can really tap into understanding information about communication and social drivers of behavior, uh, which I, I am, again, really fascinated by and uh, really drives my increasing uh, deep dive into using acoustics as a, a, a means to assess these sorts of questions. Um, I'll just close by saying that that idea that listening to animal behavior and decoding the behavioral content of animal behavior is a really uh, nascent but burgeoning field. Um, and this is something I'm really excited about is that we now have the power to link long-term passive acoustic monitoring to biolonging devices, which make acoustic recordings on the animals themselves, so that our passive acoustic records uh, go from being records of the presence of animal sounds to records of the presence of specific animal behaviors. Um, and I'm really excited about that. That's a, a topic that we reviewed recently in a, a paper that just came out a few weeks ago uh, that I'll leave you all with, um, and with this lovely artwork from my uh, co-author, Madeline Goh. So with that, that's the things I have to say about collective behavior in dynamic and changing oceanic ecosystems. Hope it's obvious that this is the kind of work that takes a ton of people to do. Uh, truly a collective effort, if you will. Um, and with that, I'll take any questions that you might all have. Awesome, thank you so much for a great talk. So now we'll open it up for questions from uh, the audience. Uh, including folks online, if you type it in the Q&A and read it out. Yeah. Uh, I'm just curious from the acoustic data, I guess I was thinking specifically with Stromo, but for other folks as well, if we're able to get any uh, assessment of how many individuals are in the area, or whether it's just like in the presence of any individual. Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, it, the answer varies uh, depending on the species, of course. Um, and there's a couple of different ways that I've been trying to approach this. So I mentioned that directional acoustic sensor, the uh, acoustic vector sensor is the term we use that's recording the sounds, but also using a really sensitive accelerometer to actually determine the path of arrival of the sound and point to where the sound is coming from. Uh, that's one tool that I've started to use to assess it still doesn't quite get you to the individual, but it gets you maybe more to like a group level rather than a regional population level. Uh, the other element is with uh, some species by the nature of the sounds, um, attributes of specific sounds you record, you can actually get to the individual level. So um, actually I, I mentioned at the very end that trends in ecology and evolution paper, uh, 
we there was another uh, sort of counterpart paper in that same issue of tree that was about a, uh, individually identifying information in acoustic recordings of wildlife. And there's a wide variety of ways you can do this depending on the species and their behavior. But sperm whales are a great example of this. So I mentioned they have those really clear uh, spacing of the clicks uh, when they're echolocating. And when there's multiple individuals echolocating simultaneously, you can actually assess how many there are based on how many distinct inner click intervals there are in the uh, in any time, if that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, so it's it's really clear when you start to hear the syncopation, you can actually hear it better than you can see it. That like, oh, I can hear four individuals right now. Um, and there's ways algorithmically to extract that information as well. Um, yeah, so I hope that answers your question yeah. in some way. But acoustics are hard for, at least passive acoustics are hard for the individual level right. stuff, but it's a growing area. Yeah. Yeah, yeah did you have something? It's that's a great question. Uh, I failed to include that on the slide. Um, it's a similar total area that we have uh, for the sperm whale detection to what I showed for the blue whales. It's like comparable spatial scale, roughly 10,000 square kilometers. But the shape of that in the area that's covered is actually different because of the nature of the signals and where the animals are distributed in the environment. So the sperm whales are producing their sounds much deeper in the water column typically than the blue whales are. So they have much, they tend to be in the midwater, like equally between the uh, bottom and the surface. So they have all of the sound waves they're producing have less interaction with the surface and the bottom. And so they tend to propagate further, but they're also higher frequency. So they tend to propagate less. Uh, so it ends up working out to being like a similar total range. But for other species, it can be really different. Like uh, we've been doing some work with Rizzo's dolphins, for example, which are deep uh, diving echolocators as well, but our detection range is very local for them, which is nice for certain questions to be like, oh, we're sure they're right here, but challenging for others in terms of like broader distribution. Yeah. You mentioned also regarding sperm whales that you were surprised that they were present throughout much of the year. Yeah. Um, like with your experience and others who have kind of longer term experience out on the water, not seeing them very much. And I'm just curious why you think that is like, is it that they're in low densities or they just don't surface as often as the other whales that you see? Yeah. It's a really good question about like, yeah, why aren't we seeing sperm whales if we're hearing them so much? Um, I think there's a few factors. One, they are known to be more of like a continental slope distributed rather than continental shelf distributed species. So they are just further from land uh, on average. They're also going down for really long periods of time, uh, much longer than any of these uh, baleen whales, um, which makes them, again, harder to observe from the surface. The other element, I, I mentioned that there's like a ton of eyes on the water in Monterey Bay, and it tends to be through the, for, for many different reasons, but largely through the whale watching industry. This is also a region that just has copious and super numerous humpback whales, super close to shore, as you probably know. And the, um, yeah, that that can be a little bit of a magnet for, you know, a, a ecotourism. So typically the, there's many eyes out there, but they're perhaps not getting to the parts of this ecosystem that sperm whales are frequenting the most. Uh, but the acoustic vector sensor, again, that spatial uh, acoustic instrument is an instrument I'm really excited to start using with the sperm whales to assess if that's actually true. Uh, or if there's some other explanation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, on a similar question, you have the graph of sperm whale acoustic detections for Alaska or whatever. That's right. And they get the patterns where they're developing first. Yes. Do you think it's the individuals who are migrating up there, or do they stay mostly resident? Yeah, it's a good question, and it's hard to assess with only two points. Um, and so this is the sort of thing I was starting to allude to at the end when I was talking about our, our more regional network in the California coast of like having a higher density of acoustic recorders to hopefully be able to get more at, at uh, is this is this indicative of individuals moving or is it, uh, yeah, like some, some different segments of the population are more resident in one place than the other. And I don't think we can firmly answer that question. The uh, simulations that I talked about with the sperm whales definitely suggest that this is the population level patterns that you're describing 
likely result from individuals having a tendency to move northward in one part of the year and a tendency to move southward during one part of the year. But whether that's specific individuals is still kind of an open question. One thing I didn't mention that is uh, exciting to me about the sperm whale acoustics is you can assess demographics from the sounds that you record from them. So that inner click interval that I mentioned uh, falls into different ranges, depending on if you're hearing an adult male, an adult female, or a juvenile. Um, so through that, in that uh, paper, we actually were able to assess that the patterns we're observing are not being driven by a single demographic group. We're seeing the same patterns across demographic groups. Uh, so that starts to get at your question a little bit, but not quite to that individual level. Yeah. I was curious if you had have like thought about any parallels to like the terrestrial system. So for, when you were talking about echolocation, you know, I had thought about bats, right? Yeah, you know, they totally. obviously have an ideal pattern. Do you see like similar, you know, intra-annual or interannual flexibility in those? Yeah, two thoughts about bats quickly. I'm really interested in bat migration, and that's a super hard thing to study, but I'm excited to learn more from people who are way deeper in biologging world than I am about that. The other thing I'll say is that a lot of the follow-up studies that I'm now working on on sperm whales are inspired by hypotheses and uh, answers to those hypotheses uh, from bat systems. So uh, there's been a really cool body of work about how bats arrange themselves spatially while foraging to maximally uh, take advantage of the social information that everyone else is producing. Because everyone, there's really no hiding anything as an echolocator, right? Uh, when you have success, everyone hears it as your clicks get closer and closer to the prey item. Uh, the same could be true of sperm whales, right? We actually, from the acoustic data, we hear prey capture events as you hear those clicks getting closer and closer together and then becoming so close together that they sound like a continuous sound. We know that they're approaching a prey item. Um, so a question that I'm now working on, again, using that spatially explicit acoustic sensor is to assess whether sperm whales might be eavesdropping on one another, uh, listening to one another's successes uh, to guide their own search for food in the deep. Um, these are things that have been seen in some bat species and, and inspire that work, but yeah. Awesome, that was great. I think if there are any other questions, mm -hmm. will you be around after? Oh yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to hang out for a little bit. Okay, so, perfect, yeah. well, let's give you another round. Yeah, and thank you everyone for coming up to this week's Quantum. Uh, we hope to see you next week when Brendan Wallace